welcome everybody. Hi, my name is Rabia Dadu, and I'm a clinical research associate with the Center for Health Equity Transformation. Welcome to our um, our chat chat spotlight series today with Professor Megan Kashner. We are very excited to be hosting uh, Professor Kashner. She is a clinical assistant professor and director of social impact at Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management. Uh, she focuses on areas of impact investing, social entrepreneurship, sustainability, nonprofit management, policy, global development, values, and ethics. She leads up the Global Impact and Sustainable Finance Faculty Consortium, the Kellogg Morgan Stanley Sustainable Investing Challenge, and more collaborative work at the intersection of markets and impact. She brings an extensive background in the impact sector, including as a founder of Benevolent and Colorful Capital. Uh, she previously served as executive director for the Taproot Foundation, and before that, spent a career in direct service with families and individuals in a variety of social service settings. Uh, Professor Kasher holds an MBA from the Kellogg School of Ma Management, a master's from University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration, and a BA in public policy from Brown University. Uh, a big welcome to Professor Kasher. Thank you for being here with us. It is my pleasure to be here, and I am going to take, uh, thank you for the applause, Melissa. Uh, <laughs> you're my new best friend. Um, <laughs> I want to take the professor's prerogative and ask that at least a good number of you, please turn your cameras on. You might be eating your lunch, you might be drinking your coffee, but I would love to see your faces, um, because what I'd like to do is, you know, give somewhat of a talk and then leave a lot of time open for questions and discussion. Oh, look at that. Thank you. I appreciate that. All these fantastic people. Okay, so I'm going to share my slides. And we will jump in. Okay, so, you know, the three things that I we focused in for me to talk about today, or maybe it's it's four. Uh, one was around my career trajectory, which people somehow find fascinating, I think, because I can't hold still. I'm always moving around. Um, but really, from a more um, foundational perspective, for us to talk about what does social impact mean, especially in business and in finance, uh, how and where does health equity and access to healthcare fit into the ways that businesses see their responsibilities? Um, and how can people make their own impact work sustainable for themselves and their organizations? So to some extent, uh, I named this talk Social Impact Markets and Money, but really to some extent I could have called it, how do you get from social work to business school professor to founding a venture capital firm because I'm just guessing that you might be able to count on one hand the number of people who went from social work like clinical social work to founding a venture capital firm. I don't think there are a lot of us out there. Uh, so that levity aside, I have had the opportunity um, and the um, uh, uh, I've had ants in my pants, as my father would have said, like moving around a lot. So I've gotten to do lots of different things. I have had lots of roles across the social impact spectrum from outreach coordinator in roles shortly out of college to executive director, founder and CEO and social entrepreneur, um, and now professor, which is a, a, a hat I love to wear. Um, and just recently, the general partner of a venture capital firm that I can tell you a little bit about more about that if you want to know later. But I've also gotten to work a lot across a lot of areas of impact um, from mental health, working with young people who had a uh, history of uh, getting into trouble for sexual aggression to people experiencing uh, houselessness and homelessness, uh, working with, in family support and early childhood, uh, working with big data, working in social innovation, and now working around LGBTQ plus economic inclusion. Uh, in the last several years, I've gone really deep into impact investing and sustainable finance, and we can talk about that a little bit as well. Let's start with this question. What is social impact? And if we had more than an hour and this was more of a class than a talk, I would ask you guys to chime in. And please feel free, actually, to use the chat. Um, if you have 
thoughts. So instead of calling on people, maybe we can just use the chat if people want to chime in. We all have a different sense of what is social impact, right? What is it that makes a difference? How do we know it when we see it? What are the aspects of a certain company, a program, an intervention um, that, that, that call to us as bringing those essential components of social impact? But interestingly, that definition really is different for many different people. So what I'm gonna share with you right now is my personal definition. I had to come up with this because to some extent uh, in my role at Kellogg, we have a pool of money and I have to decide which student social entrepreneurs or which student entrepreneurs, which of their ventures I'm going to count as being social impact ventures and which ones I'm gonna say, mm, yeah, no, like that's a great idea, but I can't give you funding out of our social impact pool for that. So that was the impetus for me to need this definition, but I found that it's actually served me really well uh, in other things as well. So this is my definition, that social impact to me is something that causes, now that's a big word, causes, a significant positive change that addresses a pressing social challenge. So I'm gonna unpack this a little bit. Causality is a big thing to prove, right? Knowing for sure that the mentoring program that you implemented for this subset of middle school kids was the thing that helped some portion of those kids access college, right? Or make it through high school, whatever it is that you're trying to measure, that causality is hard to prove, um, but it's essential to try and figure out. Significant for those out there who work with data and work in research, you know, measurement comes up again because, you know, this mentoring in this random example I'm coming up with, it might make a difference, but how significant was that difference, right? How do we measure the portion of impact that that had on the trajectory of the young, these young people? Let's make sure the change is in the right direction. Right? You can have a social intervention that comes to the table with all good intentions, but has both positive and negative impacts. And how do we make sure that on the whole, we're, we're leaning into and, and certain about the positive change. And then the tricky part, truthfully, which is how do we know that we've identified a problem and a solution that, to that problem that is centered in a pressing social challenge? The example I, used, I like to use here is if someone kept, came to me and said, I'm a social entrepreneur, I am innovating and introducing yoga into all the kindergartens of this school district because yoga is good for young people. I would say that is fantastic. I'm sure that yoga is great for kindergartners. I don't consider it to be addressing a pressing social challenge unless what you're telling me that every single kindergarten class in this district has a pressing social challenge related to some structural inequality, right? Related to some barrier or access to resources that results in a problem that this yoga is going to resolve or address. So this is where like, right? I think we can all agree. Would we like all the five-year-olds to do yoga? That could be cool, right? It is good, but not everything that is good gets to count in that bucket as being social impact or social innovation. So let's move on to other people's definitions of social impact. So in 2015, the United Nations General Assembly adopted these 17 sustainable development goals. So quick, raise your physical hand because most of you, many of you have your, uh, okay, not all of you, but the people, okay, raise any kind of hand if you feel like you could in a sentence or two, and I'm not gonna call on you, could explain to someone what the sustainable development goals are. Who's heard of them, knows something about them. Okay, good. That is actually a reason in the US, that is a reasonable number of hands, truthfully. Uh, uh, in, in the UK, in Europe, in Asia, in Latin America, or not, maybe not as much in Asia, um, many more people generally than in the US population have heard of and have worked with the Sustainable Development Goals. 
I'm going to read to you really quickly part of the resolution that they passed or that they proclaimed when they adopted these 17 goals, which, as you can see on the screen, span, you know, poverty, inequality, cons you know, responsible consumption, gender equity, health and well-being, life below water, life on the land. It's very broad. And for each of these 17, there are pages and pages of guidance on what does that actually mean and how do you, how do you measure it? Um, and yes, Melissa, some of these things, there's a great overlay with the social determinants of health. Absolutely. Um, perhaps not 100%, right? But it, the UN Sustainable Development Goals is very nicely compatible with a view of the social determinants of health. So let me just really read this to you really quickly. We resolve between now and 2030, remember this was 2015, to end poverty and hunger everywhere, to combat inequalities within and among countries, to build peaceful, just, and inclusive societies, to protect human rights and promote gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls, and to ensure the lasting protection of the planet and its natural resources. We resolve also to create conditions for sustainable, inclusive, and sustained economic growth, shared prosperity, and decent work for all, taking into account different levels of national development and capacities. That was a bold thing, right, for the UN to proclaim in 2015 that by 2030, we're going to end poverty and hunger everywhere. I think we can all agree that no one around that table probably believed that we would eradicate poverty and hunger, but that, there, that they felt an urgency to come together across the globe to reach for this agreed set of goals. And what we can see, oh, let me not go to that slide quite yet. What we can see today, and I'll show you in a little bit, is a lot of social impact focused and development focused institutions are using these goals to help organize and report out and describe their work. And a lot of corporations are doing that as well and even financial institutions. Okay, I wanna share another useful framework. This comes out of a group called the Impact Management Platform. It's a complicated group involving lots of different players out there, but it's a group of players who are focused on the intersection of finance and impact or finance and sustainability and measurement and disclosure so that invested dollars can flow towards positive outcomes rather than negative ones. So how do they figure this out? They look at these five dimensions of impact. What is the outcome that the enterprise is contributing to? That enterprise, right? Could be a company, could be a program, could be a nonprofit, could be a public-private partnership. What stakeholders, who is experiencing this outcome? And how underserved are they in related to the outcome? Listen to that. How underserved are they in relation to the outcome? Right? That goes back to my definition of impact. Is this a significant social challenge? Right? Were these folks underserved or experiencing barriers to this outcome beforehand. How much, how many stakeholders experienced the outcome? To what degree? And how long did they experience it for? And then we get to that causality question, right? Contribution. Is this enterprise or this investor's efforts the thing that resulted in the outcomes that were, again, positive, like, right? Likely uh, better than what would have occurred otherwise. And then risk. That's where we come into that positive, right? The likelihood that the impact will be different than expected and might even spill over into the negative. So if you're really interested in this stuff and in impact measurement reporting and disclosure and even impact storytelling, the, the impact management platform, which you can just Google, is a really interesting place to look. So I'm a business school professor. And so I'm often thinking about in enterprises. I'm either thinking about the enterprises, the businesses, or nonprofits themselves, 
or the public-private partnerships, or I'm looking at the investor view on them. So when I think about enterprises, whether I'm thinking about them from the perspective of the company or the enterprise, or from the perspective of someone who might invest in those enterprises, I like this, again, from the Impact Management Project, uh, which has changed its name now to the Impact Management Platform. Um, I like this framework. It's so simple, right? You can basically have three types of impact. This fourth one is not impact, right? You, this company might cause harm. They don't care, right? They're out here. They're the outlier. But when you think about three types of intended impact that a company, I'm just going to say a company in this case, can do, can espouse, the first is acting to avoid harm, right? We're trying not to make the world, make anyone's life any worse than it was before we started. This often takes the form of companies saying, we, we follow all the regulations, right? At the, at the positive end, it's the, we want to behave responsibly. This second smaller set is we want to benefit stakeholders, right? We want to have a positive effect on the world. And those stakeholders might be our employees. They might be our customers or our clients. They might be our investors. They might be the communities or the cities or the towns or the countries in which we operate. Um, and these folks are saying, you know, we want to be a responsible business. We are going to act proactively to have this, uh, to both sustain our strong financial performance as a company, but we want to have also this positive effect on the world. And then there are companies and enterprises and, and efforts that set out with their primary goal being that positive impact, right? In this example, we want to tackle malnutrition in Africa, which is a really broad goal. Like what part of Africa? Sorry. Okay. Um, or we want to help tackle the education gap, right? These, com these companies, these enterprises are setting out to intentionally design themselves to make an impact. So I am, we are, I want to make sure we leave time for conversation. So I'm going to rush through. Oh, that is not a great, that's fuzzy. I apologize. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about Unilever. How many of us have one of these brands in our house, in our apartment, right? I see Dove, I've got some of that, Dawn. Uh, let's see, it's some Lipton maybe, Skippy peanut butter, right? We have, these are brands that we have in our households and some of them we don't, right? They're more global and they're not as much used in wherever we're living right now, which I think for many of us is here in the Chicago area. These are all brands that are under the umbrella of the company Unilever. So Unilever in 2010, they set sustainable living targets for all of their brands. They basically said 12 years ago, they said, we are going to, in every single one of our products, we are going to build in sustainability and impact in a way that makes sense for that product. So some of us have seen the body positive and, and equity focused uh, messaging campaigns that Dove has put out, for example, right? I think they got it wrong once or twice, but more, than, more often they've gotten it right. And that's intentional on their part. They are actually using that brand to try and forge some of the impact that they want to forge. So in the first 10 years after making this pledge in 2020, they reported out that they had reached 1.3 billion people with their health and hygiene programs. They had reduced the total waste footprint per consumer, I'm sorry, per consumer use of their products by 32%. They had changed their packaging. They had changed their shipping practices right? So that the waste footprint for every one of us using these products had gone down in those first 10 years by 32%. They had achieved zero waste to landfill across all of their factories. So all of their factories within that first 10 years were not sending anything to landfill, which is really impressive. Um, they had reduced greenhouse gas emissions from their manufacturing by, by 65%. And they had achieved in those first 10 years a 100% renewable grid energy electricity across 
their corporate sites. Now notice it says their corporate sites, not their manufacturing sites. So, you know, it's not all, it's not all perfect. So, you know, we're here to talk about health. So how does this intersect with health? Well, what we can see here is that Unilever, for example, this is one of hundreds of things that they try and tackle. They look at hygiene and health. And so you can see the, which SDG is that? Number six, I think in here, right? And they are setting out to benefit stakeholders and contribute to solutions, talking about sanitation as a human right, talking about cleaner toilets, uh, talking about school focused sanitation. And in here, in some of the fine print, you can see that they actually have a toilet hygiene brand that is linked into this, right? There's a product that's linked to this, but they're doing more than the product. Okay, whoops, I moved on already. So this is an example of a company that decided, and I, I wanna go back here, that they wanted to absolutely act to avoid harm. They wanted to benefit stakeholders and that in some instances where they could, they wanted to contribute to solutions. So another company, which is not whoops, as big and bold with their sustainability and social impact claims is Campbell's, right? Campbell's soup, goldfish, uh, Pepperidge Farm, right? We, I think a lot of us have eaten some SpaghettiOs, right? I was a big SpaghettiO fan as a young person. So they've got all these brands, much more traditional, lots of food, and impact is not their core brand promise. Unilever's core brand promise has become impact and sustainability. Campbell's, not so much. So they are much more typical of a brand that we see out there. But even they are doing some work. They don't have the same big, bold, we've reduced our, you know, our solid waste by this much, but they are absolutely working with the Department of Agriculture around healthy food access and education. And they're starting, if I remember, locally um, in their local markets with uh, improving nutritional offerings in K-12 schools. Uh, so here we go. This is the School Nutrition Partnership investing in Camden, New, Jer New Jersey, which is where they are. So when I said sometimes companies look at the local community as part of their stakeholder you know, base, this is one example. So how do I think about this, right? You've got my definition of social impact. We looked at the sustainable development goals. We looked at the five uh, dimensions of impact. I wanna just share one more framework. And I didn't add the social determinants of health here because this is a health focused group. I figure you all know the social determinants of health already. So this, and maybe you all use this as well. There is a framework that I like very much that comes out of Berkeley called targeted universalism. I find this to be a useful tool for my MBA students and for business leaders to understand that equity and access are more than buzzwords and much more than employee research resource groups. This illustration, right? This is, this is when you give everyone the same additional support to help them reach the apple, right? But what we can see is that these three people come at this from different places. What targeted universalism does is it says, I recognize that this person is at a structural disadvantage in trying to reach that apple. Now that structural disadvantage, that further distance from the goal, it could be for economic reasons. It could be for a history of racism and economic exclusion. It could be education. It could be family composition. It could be where they were born, in what zip code in the US or in what country in the world. But for whatever reason, this person is further from that goal. And we want, if our belief is that everyone should be able to reach that apple, we are going to have to provide different levels of support and intervention to help make sure that everyone has access to that apple. And sometimes that requires looking at difficult truths in history, 
difficult truths when it comes to privilege. And that's an interesting conversation because I teach pretty much only MBA students and business leaders. So believe me, that is a fascinating conversation that I get to have. And so I wanna bring this back to sort of the things that I've done in my career. You know, when I have worked with folks who are experiencing homelessness, you know, or houselessness as people often say now, people who were unhoused, often that situation of living outdoors, living in shelters had come about because of systemic failures in mental health services, because of market failures in compensation for work, work theft, you know, wage theft, uh, you know, underpayment, any number of things, had sometimes come about because of gender-based violence or discrimination or, you know, whatever it might have been. Then I worked for a long time with young families, right? So young families, people with young children come at trying to prepare their children to reach for whatever goals they have from very different positions, from different levels of housing stability, economic stability, familial stability, different levels of you know, parent education, safety in the communities where they live. Um, and now today I'm founding a venture capital fund to invest in folks who are LGBTQ and are founding businesses. Why am I doing that? Because we know that in my community, in the LGBTQ community, there is a wealth gap, just like many of us may have read about and experienced and learned about wealth gaps for African-American families, Black families, for Latino families, for immigrant families, uh, for people with disabilities. For this, the same is true for folks with LGBTQ plus identities in terms of barriers to access to economic stability. That can come in the form of uh, employment discrimination, uh, being disowned or distanced or you know written off by family, right? Any number of things. So, why a venture capital fund? Well, how do we access economic growth and strength? Some of the ways are home ownership. Some are getting a better job and earning more money. Sometimes the path to better economic strength comes from education, and sometimes it comes from owning a business. And so that is my particular purview these days is investment in businesses. So I am using who I am and using what I know to help build that scaffolding to help people get closer to that particular apple. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and focus on all of you and move the chat over here where I can see it. And you know that was just a weird overview of these questions that we were to talk about today, about that intersection of, uh, you know, of business, of social impact and health. I don't know if I did a great job. We were interrupted by a really disturbing Zoom bombing. Um, and so with that, I wanna open it up to people who have questions for me about the intersection of business and impact, about impact investing and sustainable finance, about my career path, about any of the frameworks that I just shared. So people can, yep, I see you, Gabrielle. People can raise hands, people can uh, put things in the chat. So let's start with Gabriella. Okay, sorry about that. Um, my biggest question is, you always talk about, like you always see people talking about, there's no ethical Gabriella, consumption. can you please, I'm sorry to interrupt, can you please um, introduce yourself? Oh, hi, my name's Gabriella Ballestas. I'm with Chicago Czech. As one of their research fellows, we are here today to watch your chat. I kind of wanted to ask, especially the most impactful one about Unilever for me, and there's so many umbrellas of business, is it's so hard to try to be an ethical consumer nowadays. And a lot of people say there's no ethical consumption under capitalism, and we see a lot of decision fatigue. Do you have any tips, techniques, tactics to be able to consume more ethically? I think that we can all tie ourselves in knots trying to consume ethically. And the truth is there aren't enough hours in the day and there are not enough dollars in our wallets to always do it right. So I think the best thing that we can do is to think about the things that we use most in terms of the volume and the things that we spend the most money on. So two different sort of top tier 
measures. When you think about the things that you use the most of, the highest volume of, you want to think about how far did they travel to get here, right? One of the biggest impacts of any products that we use is actually transporting them, right? The trucks, the planes, the trains, the tankers, all of the things that the boxes that it takes to get us here, to get it to us. Um, and so looking at those brands that you're using and, and looking at, you know, the social responsibility footprint of that company and their supply chain and you know how close the product production is to where you're buying it. Uh, and that's where the local food folks, right? The local food movement is fantastic and it can do great things, but it's really expensive, right? So thinking about once again, then the things that we spend the most money on, right? Some of the ways that we can have the most ethical consumption is to look at the animal products that we are consuming, not because I am a vegetarian, right? So I, you know, not, but I'm not saying that because of animal cruelty. I'm actually talking about greenhouse gases because once again, transportation of food and food products, but also cows actually are one of the biggest emitters of greenhouse gases on the planet because when they toot and when they burp, what comes out is methane or if you're in anywhere outside the UK, methane. Um, and so, so my answer to your question, Gabriella, is to not try and kill yourself to do all of this research, but choose a few things to research and to make more informed decisions on. And then maybe next year, choose a few more, right? Um, and, and look for bad actors as well. Um, I would not trust Twitter. I would not, right? I would, I would look more at sustainability reporting as it comes out of these companies. And truthfully, there are some groups that have done this vetting and you can look for those, uh, you know, for those people who have done that, done that homework on whatever the consumption product is. The one other thing I would say is there is an incredible growth right now in our ability to buy secondhand clothing, which is huge because clothing and fast fashion ending up in landfill, it's a big deal. Right, it takes a lot of water, a lot of transportation, a lot of human uh, capital to get our clothes to us. Uh, so the more we can buy secondhand, you know, that's an incredible benefit to the planet. Okay, that was a long answer. Kevin, go ahead. We need to un unmute Kevin. Hey, Professor Kashner. First of all, thank you so much for your presentation. That was super cool. My name is Kevin Amala, and I'm a Chet alum, incoming medical student, and I previously worked in biotech within biz dev and strategy for like a health equity biotech company. So this is all within my alley. Uh, one of the questions I had is within your venture capital practice, when you find an idea or an organization that seems really socially impactful, but doesn't seem profitable, how do you make the business case for investing within those kind of organizations? How do you navigate that? So interestingly, I did not include, I almost included a slide on the continuum of capital. So my particular venture capital fund is not going to be investing uh, in companies that will have a below market rate return. We need to invest in companies that because of the, because of the capital type that we are choosing, venture capital has to make big returns. So the impact that we're choosing is the social impact in looking at the LGBTQ plus founders, right? We are choosing that slice. Will we screen for companies that do no harm? Absolutely, right? This is our, you know, we both come out, my co-founder and I both come out of impact investing in sustainable finance. But in the spectrum of capital in impact in investing in sustainable finance, you know, the, the spectrum goes all the way from traditional capital that doesn't care what it invests in, right? Good, bad, ugly, they don't care. All the way through to socially responsible investing to impact investing, including impact first investing, and then all the way to philanthropy. And so I wanna talk a little bit about those two last two. So impact first investing says, I am willing to take less of a return on my capital, right? I'm willing to make less money on my investment because I'm paying for that impact first and foremost, right? And so in the Chicago area, we have a fantastic fund called um, Impact, Impact Engine. Um, and they do that and they do it really well. Uh, and they also blog and you can read about how they do it. 
But then the next category is philanthropy. And, you know, there is a slice of charitable funding of philanthropy that intentionally invests what we call catalytic capital. And it is capital that can help a company or an enterprise get from this stage to a bigger stage, right? They can catalyze their growth. And this catalytic capital that often comes from a blending of impact investing capital and philanthropic capital, they are impact first, impact first and foremost. And so they are doing this because they are investing in the growth of the solution rather than looking for that return. So Kevin, what you're talking about is mostly that impact first side of the spectrum. Okay, uh, I don't know who was next. I think it was Ruth. Hi, Megan, thank you so much for joining us on this great presentation. I'm Ruth Curry. I work at Northwestern Center for Civic Engagement. Um, I was wondering how in your own business ventures and also when you advise companies, how you prepare for unintended consequences since some of like the best and worst stories from the world of yes. um, social impact involves unintended, un unintended consequences of our actions and enterprises. Yeah. The biggest piece of what I would call malpractice that is, um, that, that comes out of the social impact space is people and enterprises that enter into a market, enter into a community, bring, try to bring a solution forward without doing their homework, without grounding themselves in the context of the problem they're trying to solve, without looking at who's experiencing the problem. What's the cause of the problem? What are the institutional and structural aspects that keep reinforcing this problem? What do the people who experience this problem know that we don't know about this problem? What has already been tried and what has worked and what hasn't worked? What's been tried on similar problems in similar communities in other parts of the country or other parts of the world? And who's also already working on this and should be around the table? And what is the role of local voices and local wisdom? If you do all of those things, the likelihood that you're going to have unintended consequences that you did not foresee, right? We're always, the, and unintended consequences, they happen, right? They happen. But it's the people who bumble into global development work, the people who bumble into uh, nonprofit and social impact innovation and, and intervention that you just want to just take them by their shoulders and say, stop, back up. First of all, why are you the right person to be leading this intervention? What makes you think that this intervention is the right intervention for this problem? And who are you working with, right, to align outcomes and and efforts together. So I could I could go on about this forever and stories of, uh, oh, there you are, Ruth, you moved on my screen. Um, <laughs> um, but it, it is inherently, it is so important that everything we try and do that's good, not just come from a place of goodness and good intention, but come from a place of intentionality and knowledge. So that's, that's a little, I got up on a pedestal there a little bit. Um, Norma, go ahead. Hi. Oh, sorry. Oh, hi, um, I'm Norma. I'm also one of the current Czech fellows. Uh, my question kind of revolves you're mentioning of fast fashion. And I think Tosin's earlier comment on Depop, I think, how do you choose like, what investments or what you choose to kind of put your money into what to make them seem both sustainable and catalytic, but not necessarily just because it's trendy or it currently seems like it'll make a lot of money. That is a huge question. I don't have an answer, right? Fads happen both in fashion and in social impact, um, which is crazy. You will see a period of time. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting older at this point. So I've seen, and I've been in the social impact space my entire career. 
there are literally bubbles and trends where like the hot thing for these four years was early childhood education. And then for these six years was homelessness. And then for these five years, the entire philanthropic community decided that everybody needed to collaborate and they weren't going to fund any funding proposals where there weren't at least three or four different institutions collaborating on them. So Norma, it, you know, the same thing goes as a consumer or as a participant, um, even someone who chooses where they're going to work um, in the impact space and how they're going to bring their professional selves to impact. You can't get away from the fads. They're going to happen you have to get, we have to all get better at identifying them, right? At seeing how do we, dis, how do we discern hype from true impact? And the world is getting closer to true transparency in reporting and impact. So I didn't fully read the, the note about Depop because I was a little confused. Tell me, Norma, tell me about the Depop thing. Uh, it's Tosin's comment and she also has her hand up, so I think. She can also speak on it. Okay, well. perfect, perfect. I have personally been using ThreadUp a lot lately, like it. Um, and there is actually a Kellogg alum who just graduated in June, who has a, if for any of us who use Chrome and who also shop for clothing online, it's called Benny, B-E-N-I. And it's a Chrome extension so that if you are on any website looking at clothing, it will actually pop up and say, here's where you can find that used. Right, here's where you can find, which is fascinating and really cool. Okay, uh, Norma, did I answer your question though? Yeah, yeah, you did. Uh, I thank did. you okay. so much. Okay, so Tosin, let's move on to you. Um, hi, um, going off of like the point of guess of like Depop, like I know Depop, um, I guess a lot more younger people use it. So people, I guess, it's like used for more like creative means and creative ends. So like people can like make like necklaces and like post them on there, or like upcycle like their thrifted clothes and post them on there. But like recently there's been like a lot more like processing fees and like a lot of more added taxes, which makes people not want to use the app, not as much. So I was wondering, I guess your comment on that. And uh, sorry, I had a, another question. Um, or I guess another comment, like I know I've heard of the term, I guess, greenwashing or like company yeah. greenwashing. So I guess what would your, I guess, advice be for wanting to, I guess, avoid those companies out of that and wanting to genuinely, I guess, support more sustainable things because it seems like sometimes it can be uh, used as a trend. Absolutely. So let me speak to the first one first. Uh, oh, thank you. Whoever just joined, added the, the Benny link into the chat. Here's the thing, if Depop is adding fees and taxes, they're probably doing it because they have to and because they want to continue to exist. You know, maybe they're evil and they just wanna make more money off of each transaction, but more likely that was a strategic business decision. Um, and the truth is we have gotten used to Amazon so much that we expect to be paying less in, in pay, not paying for shipping not paying transaction costs, not paying. But the truth is any sort of a startup and scaling company, which I assume, you know, Depop is not huge yet, right? They're paying credit card transaction fees. They're paying and their, their users are paying for shipping, right? And taxes, from my perspective, this is my opinion, paying taxes is one of the best things we can do, right? Because we, well, it's one of the best things companies can do. Let me say it that way, right? because responsible corporate engagement really includes contributing to you know, the tax base wherever you're doing work. Um, okay, to your second question about greenwashing. So I don't really have an opinion on the Depop thing, except that like, they're probably not adding fees to be evil, right? They're probably adding fees because they have to. Um, on the greenwashing question, the world is coming together when it comes to some of the biggest companies and how they're gonna do their accounting and disclosure around their carbon footprint and sustainability overall. In the next five years, it's gonna be much harder to greenwash than it has been up until now, especially for the bigger companies. Um, there is a new move across Europe and uh, in Latin America, and it's in conversation with the Secur Securities and Exchange Commission here what's going to be adopted, what's not going to be. But as the world gets more mature, you know, for any of us who have ever worked in a business or operated a business or had a, 
a loved one who works in a business, the, the process of accounting is standardized, right? Everybody does bookkeeping and accounting the same way all over the world, basically. And we assume, we assume that, that like accounting is accounting. Well, the truth is it took about 70 years for the world to come together on those standards for accounting. So when it comes to the standards for accounting for and disclosing uh, you know, carbon and sustainability and waste streams and all of that, the, it's also, first of all, more complicated than just money in, money out, um, but we are moving very fast towards agreement. And so the fact that you can't tell what's greenwashing and not right now makes you no different from anyone else, um, but we're getting there. So, you know, um, there are some companies that are much more transparent, like Unilever, um, and some others about their, their carbon footprint, their waste stream, about their positive and negative imp, you know, impacts, um, and some who are not yet. And generally sort of leaning into the ones who are more transparent is, is the way to avoid contributing to greenwashing. I want to say, before I call on Rabia, um, there's only so much that each of our consumption decisions can make a difference, right? Overall legislation and regulation, accountability for the biggest companies and for the biggest countries, this is where the biggest change is going to come when it comes to sustainability. So don't take yourself to task for, you know, buy a hamburger, right? Okay, I'm not going to because I'm a vegetarian, but right, you are not going to break the world by your individual consumption decisions. The markets have to shift, the regulations have to shift, and we have to vote and support those people and, and, and you know, support those companies that are acting to the benefit of, of you know, countering climate change. Okay, Rabia. Hi everyone, I'm Ravia. Um, I'm a Chicago Czech Research Fellow and I'm also an upcoming senior at Northeastern uh, Illinois University. Um, I kind of didn't have a question, I just kind of wanted to like um, just bring up a point um, since we were on the topic of like um, clothing and like getting them ethically sourced and all of that. Um, I kind of wanted to mention how um, there are like a lot of um, unethical ways that clothing is produced. Um, and those are usually the cheaper options. So I just wanted to bring up like accessibility and um, privilege to be able to like get ethically sourced, um, um, just like clothes and like things like that. So sometimes people are have to take, have to um, use the, go take those measures um, because that's just what's accessible to them. So, um, I wanted to know like kind of your thoughts on that and just what. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are a few industries where um, unpaid labor, in other words, slave labor and child labor are high and unsafe work conditions. And the textile industry is one of them. Chocolate is another, sugar is another, mining, is another right there are there are many of them but rabia you're absolutely right you know if i am you know if i'm a young person not making a lot of money or an old person no no you know or if i have a young family right i can't afford to pay for the most responsibly sourced i can't pay for patagonia clothing for my entire family right so patagonia right is the is the unilever of clothing right they are they're actually further further towards impact, like everything they do, right? They're looking at sustainability. I think one of the most sustainable things we can do is to like buy a used piece of Patagonia clothing, right? But we can't, we can't even used, it's like 20 bucks for a t-shirt. We cannot do that. And so once again, I come to what I said a minute ago, which is that we cannot by our individual choices make the, the difference that needs to be made in the world. We need to try when we are investing our retirement account, we have a choice to invest in ESG funds. ESG stands for environment, social, and governance. So that our money is going into companies that are holding higher standards um, and reporting on their impact. We, you know, we have a choice about when we know that a company or practice is outside of the bounds of ethics, that we can choose not 
to give them our money. But we have to give ourselves a little grace and say, you know what? The most important thing is that my kid has a shirt to wear to school, period. You know, end of story. Um, so Robbie, there's no simple, and you, you started your statement by saying this isn't really a question. There's no true answer to that question, right? Do we all want to walk through this world as, and, and you know, and operate as ethically as we can? Absolutely. And actually Patagonia leads, it's like the Ethical Fashion Industry Association. I'm sure I'm butchering that name. And there are actually many companies who have joined them uh, in sort of adhering to and setting some higher standards for themselves. Um, for the confection, the, the candy companies that are relying on chocolate and mint and sugar, um, you know, some are working harder than others to get unpaid slave labor out of their supply chains. And that that is in the news often. So yeah. Oh, go, go ahead, Rabia. I also kind of like um, wanted to uh, bring something up um, in regards to like uh, accessibility and equity and all of that. So um, I'm very like pro like uh, menstrual equity and like period and involved in like period poverty and period stigmas. Um, so I know that um, period products are also like part of like what's uh, inaccessible for people. Um, and I know that, um, I don't know, I, I don't believe in like uh, period products should be, uh, I, I think they should be free. And um, I actually um, work with an organization called Period um, and we kind of work to remove the stigma and just uh, fight for period equity. And um, just for any menstruators out there, there's um, a company called August and they're 100% um, organic cotton and 100% um, biodegradable and they're cheaper than um, the store-bought uh, menstrual products. So <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> will, you throw that, will you throw that link into the chat, Ravia? Yeah, I will. Thank you. I'm I am heartened to see increasing numbers of public restrooms and especially university restrooms having free period products. I um I know we do it now at Northwestern. I was at the University of Miami yesterday and the day before for a conference and they also had them for free in in you know a state like Florida. This seems to also be happening. Also they're way more comfortable. Like I yeah, they're just <laughs> Um okay, one more quick question or a statement from Jordan. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jordan Shaw. I'm also with the uh, Chicago Czech Fellows Program. And I just wanted to, um, it's more of a question than a comment, but uh, just to tie in what you said about uh, taxation and um, like individual judgments and, you know, individual consumption and whatnot. And, and the, saying that uh, like, like taxation is probably one of the best things, I guess, for, for companies. I feel like a, a lot of um, a lot of Americans don't trust the, the the government mostly because they don't understand what a government is but um it, it to me it's largely like a like an, an education thing in, in which they uh their their stance is predicated on like like largely unfounded assumptions of how societies work and how humans work and you know these kind of like biologically essentialist notions and, and things like that so uh, what would be your opinion on um I guess how information is disseminated amongst a population, and how much do we uh, should we allow for uh, like deviance from the norm? Like we we will all in, enjoy like other opinions to certain subjects, but it's like how much do we have to stop and listen to every lower thinking person? How much time do we have to, <laughs> how much time do we have to devote to their opinions? Yeah. I that's a that there is no clear answer to that question, Jordan. I want to speak to one of the first things that you said. And the truth is, people are warranted in their mistrust of government when the slice of government that most often comes into their lives is law enforcement. And there are communities, there are neighborhoods in the US where that is between that and the public schools, like that's what they see in the form of government.
and even when it comes to basic street maintenance, right, and, and access to public health services and things like that, those things are largely absent in, in many of our communities in the US that have historically been redlined, right? So, so I wanna give, I, I'm gonna use this phrase again, I wanna live, give a little grace to people who have some mistrust. But to your point, Jordan, people aren't always thinking about the fact that you know, if a company is not paying their share of local or federal taxes, local, federal, and state taxes, that that's impacting how much money we have to spend on education, how much money there is for infrastructure, including you know, stormwater solutions, including paving roads, including street lights, including you know, rail systems and public transit. But to the, and we are at time, so I wanna be, be respectful of people, but to the end of your question, like how much time do we give, I, I love your phrase, low thinking people. I think I would change those words. I would say, you know, how much time and, and energy do we give people who are not thinking, right? Who are not actually discerning and considering different facts realities on the ground and the truth is that has to be a personal that has to be a personal decision there is no point in engaging with trolls of any flavor and to me where do i draw the line i'm not engaging in any kind of meaning, meaningful dialogue with a white supremacist i'm just not like that is my line i'm not going there um and we each have to have our line and so, Jordan, that's not, again, not an answer, but you got to find your line. No, you, it's an answer. <clears throat> you, you answered it. Thank you. Okay. Well, everybody, we are at time. So I want to hand it back over to our hosts. Um, thank you. It's been so much fun. I'll stick around. I've got maybe 10 or 15 minutes to stick around before my next meeting. So if people want to hang out and chat, I'm happy to do that. Thank you so much, Professor Kashner. I really, really appreciate you. You took us through this. And, um, seamlessly i appreciate all your thoughts and presentations and all the links shared today we'll also collect those and share those out i think they're very good links um i don't know if dr simon you wanted to say a few words or anything to add just thank you thank you it is amazing um and and again i apologize to everyone for the zoom bomb <laughs> hopefully people can get past that um it's unfortunate but it happens um, uh, but I want to say there's so much wonderful alignment between what you and people in that in in social impact investment and others uh, do with respect to what I do and people in the health equity world. And I don't think we do enough intermingling intermingling. Um, so I think there's probably some opportunity to move forward in, in some kind of intermingling type way. So. Absolutely. <laughs> I'd Absolutely. love to follow up. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm in. Anyone Fantastic. else? Fantastic. Any right. other questions that people wanted to surface before we all go off and have lunch? Oh, I think want to bring them back. Oh, Terry I see Martin. Terry raising her hand. Mm -hmm. You are muted still, though, Terry. Someone might have to help. Okay. I think I'm I think I'm there. So I don't work in the um, the business space. I work in um, you know academic research, but trying to link conservation, environmental justice, and public health. And one of the things I've been finding and others have discovered this is um, People, especially you know, in the red line communities in various places, feel that they have been over-researched. And wow. the issue of when we come in and say, okay, we want to be able to, well, even so we say, you know, how can we develop the evidence that's needed to help you find or to show that your program is having impact so that you know it can move forward. So be, there's um, an issue of how do we message the need for research and how do we think about what information do funders need? And I'm actually planning a symposium for later for this fall at a conference that I'm going to that is that question of, you know, how do we get the, you know, what, what questions will people answer and what information do funders need? 
And so how do we engage in that conversation and message the need for yeah. for research in a proper way? I mean, my my gut instinct is to push back on the funders yeah. and to say after uh, you know a hundred years mm -hmm. of redlining i don't know i'm making that number up but it's probably right right after this long of redlining after the amount of research that has already gone in to the structural barriers mm -hmm. to you know economic development and and family access to to resources and opportunities for advancement what more do you need right mm -hmm. If what they're looking for is research on a particular intervention, then I like to challenge research. I like to challenge funders to say, that's great. In addition to funding the intervention, we'd be happy to give you a proposal for funding the research that will walk alongside that intervention to build the case, right? They often, they're often asking for the case for support before the intervention has had a chance. Yeah, and they're mm -hmm. often asking for for data that couldn't possibly exist. Why are they doing that? So that they cannot fund it. Yeah, well, and also what we find is um, the size of the budget is minuscule for doing any kind of evaluation. So the, uh, the need to push back and say, "Look, you want these data? Then we need to be able to hire the people to." get the data yes I, I this was back in like oh nine or something and i was running a program and there was a small committee of a local government that was giving like eighty thousand dollars a year to a a program that provided uh full-time high quality child care services to the children of teen parents mm -hmm. and they legit asked me when i was we were up for renewal to get this eighty thousand dollars for the next year they said what evidence do you have that 15 years into this teen parenting child care program that the children of the parents from 15 10 15 years ago are better off as a result and i legit looked at them and i said i like you know i played with my papers i was like i you know i know i've only been in this role for two years but i don't actually know of any history of funding for a controlled research mm -hmm. you know study of this program going back 15 years so there's there will not be a way for me to answer that question like and just having the the cojones to say that to a funder <laughs> right like not a lot of um local institutions have that footing to be able to take that risk and say that and mm -hmm. so researchers one of the things that researchers can do mm -hmm. is to actually say that for the the local interventionists the nonprofits and others that can't say it yeah that's good thank you so i don't know why saying cojones in spanish is any more socially acceptable than saying it in english but you know right <laughs> <laughs> anything else everybody I the other I thing oh go ahead ruth i'm sorry oh just one quick question i mean i i really um have learned so much from following Melissa Simon, Chet, all these workshops. Do you know of other valuable resources within the Northwestern community where you keep in touch and network with people who are focused on social impact? There are these research and data groups that they pull together for faculty across, uh, across areas. One is on sort of local and civic engagement. One is on sustainability. I don't remember what the other ones are. So there are some of those, but they're really looking more on research. Um, and I, you know, I'm a clinical faculty member, so I'm not a, I'm not a researcher. Um, I don't have the answer. I don't, maybe Melissa has more of an answer. This no. Is, well, is yeah, uh, it, it, at the university level, perhaps the Center for Civic Engagement has a little more um, information on that, but I, I would hope, but I'm not sure. Um, yeah, thank no you idea. guys. I want to say one more thing to Terry, what you were talking about, and I had a quick conversation with my son yesterday. He's a PhD student in economics, not at Northwestern, and he wanted to run by a research project that he's thinking about doing, he wanted to run it by me. And, and I'm gonna to say to everyone what, something that I said to him, which is please build the tech transfer future 
for this data system in from the very beginning. Because so often researchers have amazing sets of data and systems of analysis of that data that could be yielding benefits for nonprofits, for elected officials, for you know, the, the allocation of public dollars for years into the future and some basic, you know, how you develop this and whether it pulls the data in a static or dynamic way, right? How the data system is queryable. If you can build some of that in, in the beginning, then the transfer of that technology and that data access out into the market in the future is gonna be exponentially better. And two things that go along with that design for dissemination is what we're always trying to push. Yeah. Apparently like I didn't know there was a phrase for that. <laughs> so, but I mean, that's actually, there's, it's a well-studied thing, but people neglect to do it. Um, implementation science is a perfect example of, you got to design it up front for dissemination, but not just dissemination. Like it needs to be thoughtful about who the who who the populations are, people that are gonna be the end users yes. of the particular thing, like you said earlier. And that's why community partnerships and having a lot of uh, diversity, diverse um, people um, iteratively designing this thing as it goes uh, along um, is really critical. Um, and, and then really thinking about where the biases along the way can happen in the way those systems are created, That's right? Exactly those right. algorithms and all the things that could be have unintended consequence. And and I and I love that design for what is it designed for dissem dissemination? Uh -huh. And I think often that researchers don't realize that that dissemination is messy. There is not a single dec decision making body. There is not, it's not that, oh, when these people at this particular moment of time need this data, right? It, it, it is messy. Lots of people are going to need to have access to whatever this is before it finds where it can be most useful. So anyway, okay, I have to go. I have a meeting in four minutes. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This was